Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our trip to Scotland, a rugged, beautiful country in Northern Europe with proud people who are more likely to have red hair and blue eyes than any other people of the world. Scotland is usually made up of over 700 individual islands, home to officially three languages, English, Scots Gaelic, and Scots, and the original inventors of the game of golf. Let's explore. First, I hope you all packed your raincoats because Scotland is one of the wettest and foggiest countries in the world. In fact, there were a mere 36 minutes of sunshine recorded in the entire month of January in 1983 in the city of Cape Wrath in the Highlands. Granted, that was a record, but it can convey the feeling of the wet and cool weather. Still, the atmosphere adds a certain romance and challenge to Scottish culture, and they are fiercely proud of their distinctive region. The capital of Scotland is Edinburgh, which is not pronounced like it's looked, I've learned. Perched above the city of Edinburgh on Castle Rock is Edinburgh Castle. Archaeologists have established human occupation of the rock since at least the Iron Age, 2nd century AD, although the nature of the early settlement is unclear. There has been a royal castle on the rock since at least the reign of David I in the 12th century, and the site continued to be a royal residence until 1633. As one of the most important strongholds in the Kingdom of Scotland, Edinburgh Castle was involved in many historical conflicts. Research done in 2014 identified 26 sieges in its 1,100-year-old history, giving it a claim to having been the most besieged place in Great Britain and one of the most attacked in the world. The castle also hosts educational and entertaining information about Scotland's past, such as archery competitions using the long-feared Scottish longbow, reenactments of the Jacobite Rebellion with stories of how it tore families apart, and this demonstration we've just come on to about historical instruments in Scotland and how they were used. Many outsiders associate Scottish folk music almost entirely with the Great Highland Bagpipe, which has long played an important part in Scottish music. Although this particular form of bagpipe developed exclusively in Scotland, it is not the only Scottish bagpipe. The earliest mention of bagpipes in Scotland dates to the 15th century, although they are believed to have been introduced to Britain by the Roman armies. Now let's trek down to Bowness on Solway and catch a glimpse of the famous Hadrian's Wall. Now it is a common misconception that Hadrian's Wall marks the boundary between England and Scotland. In fact, Hadrian's Wall lies entirely within England and has never formed the Anglo-Scottish border. While it is less than 0.6 miles south of the border with Scotland in the west at Bowness on Solway, in the east it is as much as 68 miles away. Still, we're close enough that we'll have a look at it. The wall stretches for 73 miles and originally a defensive fortification in the Roman province of Britannia, begun in AD 122, in the reign of the Emperor Hadrian. It ran from the banks of the River Tyne near the North Sea to the Solway Fifth on the Irish Sea. It had a stone base and a stone wall. There were small forts with two turrets in between, with a larger fort placed about every five Roman miles. From north to south, the wall comprised a ditch, wall, military road, which was another ditch with adjoining mounds. A significant portion of the wall still stands and can be followed on foot along the adjoining Hadrian's Wall path, the largest Roman artifact anywhere. Regarded as a British cultural icon, Hadrian's Wall is one of Britain's major ancient tourist attractions. With all of that walking from Hadrian's Wall, we need a break. Welcome to Scottish Black House, restored from their more historical existence. They now come complete with all the modern conveniences you would ask for, and that historical housewives of Scotland probably would have killed for. Luxurious? Perhaps not, but cozy? Definitely. And you'll have a great story to tell when we get back to the States. So go ahead and sleep in Scotland's history for a night, and we'll get back to our travels in the morning. As we wake up, I thought we might like to stretch our legs going down the Royal Mile, the name given to a succession of streets 
forming the main thoroughfare of the old town of the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. The thoroughfare is, as the name suggests, approximately one mile long and runs downhill between two significant locations in the history of Scotland, namely Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood Palace. It is the busiest tourist street in the old town. From here, we'll get another excellent view of Edinburgh Castle. Perched on her extinct volcanic rock all the way down to St. Giles Cathedral. An impressive piece of 14th century architecture. Most noteworthy might be the famous crown steeple, which plays a supporting role in Edinburgh's breathtaking city skyline. This place of worship is dedicated to St. Giles, the prominent medieval saint of the disabled and lepers, as well as the patron saint of Edinburgh. But there are one or two stops on the Royal Mile that I've particularly scheduled for us to visit. The first is called the Scotch Whiskey Experience. Now, Scotch is, of course, the native water of Scotland, and I don't think we could have properly visited the place without a tour of how it is made in an old-fashioned, recreated distillery. Having first opened to the public in 1988, the Scotch Whiskey Experience was created when 19 individual Scotch whiskey companies jointly invested money toward showcasing the Scotch whiskey industry to international visitors. Each tour includes time in the world's largest collection of Scotch whiskey, housed here since 2009. The collection comprises 3,384 different bottles and has been described as one of the seven wonders of the whiskey world. The origins of malt whiskey distilling in Scotland are lost in the mist of antiquity. They date back at least to the monks of the 15th century and probably long before. Although the distiller's art has been understood since earliest times, the subtle aromas and flavors of whiskey have never been fully explained, even today. The ancient term ushkaba, which is Gaelic for the Latin term aqua vita, or water of life, was corrupted in the 18th century to ushki and then to whiskey. The following description is a generalization of the process. So what gives Scotch whiskey its distinctive flavor? This is one of the mysteries of the industry and a secret which many imitators of Scotch whiskey have tried in vain to discover. Many theories and explanations have been put forward, but there is no universally accepted solution. The distilling process itself is one factor. Scotch whiskey, after it has been distilled, contains not only ethyl alcohol and water, but certain secondary constituents. The exact nature of these is not fully understood, but it is believed they include some of the essential oils from the mal malted barley and other cereals and substances that derive from the peat. But whatever the cause, it can only be found here in Scotland. Many other products which were originally manufactured only in a particular lo locality have lost their geographical significance and can now be manufactured anywhere. The word Scotch, however, as applied to whiskey, has retained its geographical significance. This is widely recognized in law throughout the world. Thus, whiskey may be described as Scotch whiskey only if it has been wholly distilled and matured in Scotland for a minimum of three years. As we leave the whiskey experience and keep walking down the Royal Mile, some of you may notice the disruption in the cobblestones. This is called the Heart of Midlothian, this small mosaic has a long history. In the 15th century, this spot marked the entrance into the old toll booth, a series of government buildings, including an infamous jail. This spot also marks where public hangings would occur, and some believe some rather shameful, torturous practices occurred inside the old toll booth. In those days, when one was finally freed from within her halls, you would spit on the sidewalk outside the toll booth to show the government just what you really thought of them. Nowadays, it is considered very good luck to spit on the heart of Midlothian, so if you all line up here, we'll proceed to spit and show the old government what's what. But for the darker history of the Royal Mile, we'll have to go into a darker place. I hope nobody is claustrophobic, because we're going underground into Mary King's Close. 
named for Mary King, who was a textile merchant and Burgess in 1630s who occupied two properties here. A close is a street with buildings very close together, perhaps no more than six feet apart, though rising many stories high. The tall, vertical, and narrow alleys generally make humans feel uncomfortable and nowadays carry connotations of dark dealings and sneaky attacks. Every everyone ready to see it? Narrow, dark, and stuffy, Mary King's Close is a collection of connected, hidden closes and narrow streets where people lived, worked, and died during the early years of the capital. When the city became overcrowded and start expanding in the 1700s, the decision was made to simply build over these dirty streets, using them as the foundation for the grand and expensive buildings of the Royal Mile. After the close was covered, the winding streets draughty homes and hidden passageways lay relatively untouched for more than 250 years. Now the site is run as a tourist attraction and museum, with guides dressed as historical characters who explain the history and legends of the close. Our tour guide is Joan A., a daughter of Mary King. After descending the stairs, we find ourselves in a typical close house with a urine pot in the corner. The pots would be chucked out from the windows and into the streets at 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. every day. Of course, the youngest would have to do this, Jonay tells us, looking at Vanessa. The wealthiest people of the close would live in the middle levels of the houses, far enough away from the scummy streets, but not too far up the ladders to the top levels. Those rich enough to have a toilet might wee with the door open to show off their good fortune, amongst other things. In the next section, Jonay tells us of one of the infamous murders of the close. The murder in question is of Alexander Kant, killed by his wife, Catherine, and her mother, Alison Ruff, here in 1535. Things turned nasty when Alexander sued Alison for not paying all of Catherine's dowry. It got even nastier for Alexander when he was beaten to death with a pair of fire tongs. Allison was executed for the murder by being drowned in the Norlock. Catherine was pregnant, so managed to escape immediate execution and later fled to Germany. Many died in the uns uh, unsanitary and dangerous tight quarters of the close, if not by murder, then frequently by disease. The Black Plague was well known here. The next room is full of toys and dolls, and Jonay tells us it is Annie's room. Annie's story originates from a visiting Japanese psychic who apparently felt sadness in the room and something pulling on her coat as she began to leave. When she turned around, she saw a young girl crying and dressed in rags. The girl said she was called Annie and that she had been abandoned by her parents after contracting the sickness. To make things worse, she'd also lost her doll. The psychic returned with a tartan-clad Barbie for her, and since then, visitors have been bringing presents of their own. Did anyone bring anything for Annie? Emerging back out of the close into a bright sunlight, leaving the ghost stories and tragic history behind us, let's cheer ourselves up by ducking into the classic Scottish restaurant for a classic Scottish meal. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's haggis. This national dish consists of a sheep's stomach stuffed with diced innards, normally made up of a sheep's pluck, its heart, liver, and lungs, minced with onions, oatmeal, salt, and spices, all mixed with a stock, and traditionally boiled in the animal's stomach for around an hour. The exact historical origins of this great national dish appears to have been lost in the mists of time. Some claim that the dish originates from the days of the old Scottish cattle drivers, when the men would leave the highlands to drive their cattle to market in Edinburgh, and the women would prepare a ready meal for them to eat on the long journey through the glens. Others have speculated that the first haggis was uh, carried to Scotland aboard a Viking longboat. Yet another theory ties the dish to prehistoric origins as a way of cooking and preserving offal that would otherwise quickly spoil a lot following a hunt. 
This was done by dicing the pluck and then stuffing this and whatever other ingredients were available into the stomach, immersing the bundle in the water contained with the skin of the beast, and then boiling for an hour or two. Nice and tidy, no washing up required. Be forewarned, Scots love to tease foreigners about catching a wild haggis. Ask any Scotsman the age-old question, what is a haggis? And his typical response would be something like, it's a small four-legged creature that lives in the highlands and has two legs shorter than the others, so it, can't, it can run around the mountains without toppling over. It can easily be caught by running around the hill in the opposite direction. Well, it appears that national joke is now beginning to backfire a little. According to a 2003 online survey, one-third of American tourists visiting Scotland thought that a haggis was a wild animal and almost a quarter arrived in Scotland thinking they could catch one. Perhaps a different Scottish treat would be more popular. The story of shortbread begins with the medieval biscuit bread. Any leftover dough from bread making was dried out in a low oven until it hardened into a type of rusk. The word biscuit means twice cooked. Gradually, the yeast in the bread was replaced by butter and biscuit bread developed into shortbread. Shortbread was an inexpensive luxury and for ordinary people, shortbread was a special treat reserved just for special occasions such as weddings, Christmas, and New Year's. In Shetland, it was traditional to break a decorated shortbread cake over the head of a new bride on the threshold of her new home. Okay, setting aside shortbread and haggis, Scots are also known for another symbol of their country, their own native game, golf. A spokesman for the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews, one of the oldest Scottish golf organizations, said, Stick and ball games have been around for many centuries, but golf as we know it today, played over 18 holes, clearly originated in Scotland. The word golf is usually thought to be a Scots alteration of Dutch kolf or kolv, meaning stick, club, or bat. You'll sometimes hear a story that the word golf comes from a sign hung outside the course of St. Andrews in Scotland, which read, gentlemen only, ladies forbidden, golf being taken from the first letter of each word, but apparently the practice of turning acronyms into words is very recent. Golf is much older. The first documented mention of golf in Scotland appears in a 1457 Act of the Scottish Parliament, an edict issued by King James II of Scotland prohibiting the playing of the games of golf and football as they were a distraction from archery practice for military purposes. Bans were again imposed in Acts of 1471 and 1491, with golf being described as an unprofitable sport. Mary, Queen, Queen of Scots, was accused by her political enemies of playing golf after her second husband, Henry Stuart Lord Dar Darnley, was murdered in 1567. George Buchanan subsequently wrote that she had been playing sports that were clearly unsuitable for women. But let's go check out the home of that mythical haggis, one of the most beautiful parts of Scotland, the Highlands. If you're a fan of hiking, majestic mountain ranges, floating mist-covered lochs, or exploring ancient forests, then you'll love the Highlands. There's tumultuous history here, dark tales of epic clan battles and murderous plots, mythical legends of lake monsters, fairies, and goblins. In the Highlands, you never know what hidden treasures you'll uncover while venturing off into the Scottish countryside. And with animals like this, there's no wonder that the Scottish Highlanders were so readily able to come up with other mythical creatures. This is a sky cow or a Highland cow. Highland cattle are very hardy and have to be able to withstand the outdoors, the long, harsh winters common in this region of Scotland. Records also show that Highland is actually the oldest registered breed in the world, mostly due to the fact that their herd book predates all others. The Highland breed is predominantly used for beef production, but can be milked on a small scale. Their milk has a high butter fat content, which some farmers find appealing. The Highlands are also home to some famous lakes called lochs in Scotland, such as this one, Loch Lomond, featured in a famous song about a man and his love and a death which separates them in Scotland forever. 
But of all the locks in Scotland, this is perhaps the most famous. Even people who do not know that Loch means lake have heard of Loch Ness and the supposed beast who lurks in her murky depths. The earliest report of a monster in the vicinity of Loch Ness appears in The Life of St. Columba by Adamnan, written in the 6th century AD. According to Adamnan, writing about a century after the events described, Irish monk St. Columba was staying in the land of the Picts with his companions when he encountered local residents burying a man by the river Ness. They explained that the man was swimming in the river when he was attacked by a water beast, which mauled him and dragged him underwater. Although they, they tried to rescue him in a boat, he was dead. Columba sent a follower to swim across the river. The beast approached him, but Columba made the sign of the cross and said, Go no further. Do not touch the man. Go back at once. The creature stopped as if it had been pulled back with ropes and fled, and Columba's men and the Picts gave thanks for what they perceived as a miracle. Believers in the monster point to this story, set in the river Ness rather than the lock itself, as evidence for the creature's existence as early as the 6th century. Skeptics question the narrative's reliability, noting that water beast stories were extremely common in, in med medieval times, and Adamnan's tale probably recycles a common motif attached to a local landmark. Modern interest in the monster was sparked by a sighting on July 22, 1933, when George Spicer and his wife saw a most extraordinary form of animal cross the road in front of their car. They described the creature as having a very large body, about four feet high and 25 feet long, wavy, narrow neck, slightly thicker than an elephant's trunk, and as long as the 12-foot width of the road. They saw no limbs. It lurched across the road towards the lock 20 yards away, leaving a trail of broken undergrowth in its wake. Seen here is a monument to Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, at a visitor center at Loch Ness. Periodically, the media reports new interest in Nessie or new theories as to why she hasn't been seen or what it is people are actually seeing. We can tour a few of the photographic pieces of evidence here in this gallery, but generally they're always taken to be hoaxes, seals, drifting logs, rocks, or boats. The sea otters and eels, which live in Loch Ness, as well as the other highland lakes, are a common suggestion for the photos, particularly to out-of-area guests who are unfamiliar with the actual activity and look of these creatures. And so Nessie remains shrouded in the murky lock water until April of 2016. British researchers using sonar imaging to scan the bottom of Loch Ness for geological pur purposes found a large bulk with an extending neck, the entire thing reaching almost 30 feet long. None could believe what they were seeing. Their equipment could tell it was not a rock or a tree or some sort of mound on the floor. This was something else. A robotic probe was sent down to investigate, and the response was sent back. They had found Nessie. Well, sort of. After filming The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes in 1970, the Loch Ness Monster movie Prop was damaged, so it would sink to the bottom of the lock environmental regulations still being a thing to be hoped for. The prop lay there until 2016 when it was discovered by the researchers. As much a symbol of Scotland as Nessie, and also originating in the Highlands we're touring, is the kilt. Now I didn't know this, but originally the kilt came in two forms. The earlier or the older type is the great kilt, which was a huge piece of wool fabric laid out and tied a certain way with a great deal of excess fabric, which was held over the arm or slung over the shoulder. This allowed the wearer to pull the fabric around themselves like a cloak, to tie it up out of the way, or to be worn in several different ways to navigate the changing Scottish weather. Wool naturally helps keep you dry, after all, in all that rain. Over time, this came to be simplified into the walking kilt, made with much less fabric and not requiring laying out and trying to put on. Originally, the pleats in the kilt were created by folding the garment as it lay flat over and over again. 
In the walking kilt, the pleats are sewn in and so less cumbersome to deal with. It was invented in the 1720s to help make labor easier. In an effort to destroy cultural loyalties and Scottish clan identities, the British outlawed kilts in 1745, a ban which lasted until 1782. But during those years, it became fashionable for Scottish romantics to wear kilts as a form of protest against the ban. The kilt became identified with the whole of Scotland with the pageantry of the visit of King George IV to Scotland in 1822, even though nine out of 10 Scots now lived in the lowlands. Scott and the Highland societies organized a gathering of the gale and establish entirely new Scottish traditions, including lowlanders wearing a stylized version of the traditional garment of the Highlanders. At this time, many other traditions, such as clan identification by Tartan, were, de were developed. Yes, many Scottish Americans today will proudly wear and display their clan tartan, but the practice of certain patterns re relating to certain tribes is relatively recent. Early Romans talked of the Celtic tribes wearing bright striped clothing. There was no word at that time for checkered. In those times, until the 1800s or so, every clan in any given area of the Highlands would have one weaver who probably knew how to make one pattern and could dye his wools with only locally available dyes. Thus, it is true that in any given area, those who lived there, who were probably related and probably of the same clan, would wear the same plaid pattern. However, there was no system or code as to which pattern went with which name. After the ban on tartans and kilts was lifted and being a Highlander became oh so chic, tailors and weavers began codifying the tartan patterns and certain families became associated with certain patterns. There are now lists of registered tartans and some come up with rules about who can wear what and when. If you'd like, the internet can show you the tartans associated with your family and you could proudly wear your plaid. And so we leave Scotland behind us, but I hope you enjoyed your trip and learned a little bit more about this beautiful, rugged country near the top of the world.